Good morning. Yesterday we had some technical difficulties broadcasting uh, the live mass, so I thought today I would uh, read the gospel from yesterday and also give my sermon, as well as uh, since this is the anniversary of my uh, final profession as a Benedictine, I also want to review my vows today. So the gospel reading is taken from the 11th chapter of Luke's gospel, verses 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying, and when he had finished, one of the disciples asked, Rabbi, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Abba God, holy is your name. May your kingdom come. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we too forgive everyone who sins against us. And do not let us be subjected to the test. Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. A neighbor, and you go to your neighbor at midnight and you say, Lend me three loaves of bread, because friends of mine on a journey have come to me, and I have nothing to set before them. Then your neighbor says, Leave me alone. The door is already locked, and the children and I are in bed. I cannot get up to look after your needs. I tell you, Though your neighbor will not get up to give you the bread out of friendship, your persistence will make your neighbor get up and give you as much as you need. That is why I tell you, keep asking and you will receive. Keep looking and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be opened to you. For whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks is admitted. What parent among you will give a snake to their child when the child asks for a fish, or a scorpion when the child asks for an egg? If you, with all your sins, know how to give your children good things, how much more will our heavenly Abba give the Holy Spirit to those who who asked. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When I was a kid, there was a pizza place in town called Shakey's Pizza that became my favorite pizza place of all time. And every now and then I go online to see if they're still in existence, and the last time I checked, they were all gone, except for one, stuck in the middle of Arkansas or some other godforsaken place. Not only was their pizza really good, and these fried potatoes called Mojo's, but they were also the first place that I ever knew that had those amazing vending machines with the stuffed animals. You know the ones I mean. They're all glassed in and there's a heap of stuffed uh, critters in there and for 50 cents or 75 cents maybe you would put your coins in and then you would make your selection and then you would use the control knob, the little joystick, to go with the claw and it would come down and it would grab the toy that you wanted. I was surprisingly good at this. And literally, every time I dropped a few coins in the machine, I came away with prizes. Sometimes, other people would ask me to get prizes for them and for their kids. If I take a little time, to review my prayer life over the six plus decades of my life, whether it's the prayers I had to memorize as a boy, 
or the extemporaneous prayers that I offer each Sunday, I can't help but draw a connection between that stuffed animal vending machine and the way I have looked at prayer. I put in the correct change, I make my selection, and I get what I want. For everyone who asks, receives, Jesus says. Everyone who searches, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be opened to them. Truthfully, I suspect most of us are kind of on that same page. We offer the coins of our wants and our needs, our beliefs, our good behavior. We tell God what we want because we have already made our selection. And then we sit back and we expect to get exactly what we asked for. And it works great, amazingly well, until it does not. That old vending machine, and I don't even know if they still have those, I haven't seen them in a while, but that old vending machine was great until it took all your money, or you didn't get anything, or worse, you got a giraffe when you were trying to get the unicorn over in the corner. And when that happens, of course, we get annoyed and frustrated. So we put some more money in. We maybe even jiggle the machine or try to move it to get things uh, to where they need to be. You know, we did our part. And we want the results that we paid for. And it is the same thing with prayer. We get angry and we feel hurt and betrayed when those prayers aren't answered. And some of us will lose our faith. Some of us will stop coming to church. Some of us will stop believing that God even loves us. You know what's weird, though? In 65 years of living and in 15 years of ordained priesthood, I have never once had somebody pick up the phone and call me all emotionally unregulated, demanding to know why their prayer was answered, why they got everything that they prayed for exactly as they prayed for it. Because sometimes we ask and we do receive. We seek and we find. We knock and the door, man, that freaking door just opens wide. And we don't even wonder why. But man, turn that coin over and we certainly do want to understand why we asked but did not receive. Why we searched and searched and did not find a thing why we knocked the heck out of that door and it never budged. So I went to bed late that night praying like crazy that the police were wrong, that it was all some kind of big mix-up that would all be sorted out in the morning. I grabbed my rosary. I prayed my rosary with words. I prayed in painful silence. I prayed with soul-crushing tears. And with the passing of every hour, my praying became more and more desperate. More coins. Push the button, grab the joystick, try to get the prize. Please, God, please. And in the morning, nothing had changed because my son Christopher was still dead. Ask and it will be given. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will open for you. This is the story of every single one of us who has prayed from the depths of our heart. 
We have all lost our money from time to time. I want to be able to say at this point in my life that I have finally, finally figured all this out. But that would not be honest. That would be another one of those pious clergy lies, those little platitudes that my fellow clergy men, and I use the word men uh, intentionally here, that they use to bring fake comfort to people. But the problem is those fake statements, those platitudes of falsehood, end up making the whole gospel of Jesus Christ look like BS. In fact, I do not know why some prayers are answered and why other prayers are not. I don't have a single decent good answer for any of that. But, alas, I have heard a hundred really crappy explanations. You didn't pray hard enough. Your faith wasn't strong enough. You were asking from a place of pride. It's all a mystery and part of God's plan. Everything happens for a reason. Oh, I'm out of my mind when I hear other clergy say those things because I do not believe or accept any one of those statements. Because those are really, if you think about it, those statements are nothing but feeble attempts to justify our vending machine attitude toward prayer. We have got to let that go, seriously, because it's wrong. It hurts people. It hurts our understanding of who God is. And when I hear those lame justifications and explanations, you know what? I can't help but remember another guy. Another guy who struggled praying late into the night. Praying with words, with sweat, with blood. Please, God. Please. And they crucified him less than 24 hours later. Ask, search, knock. I do not understand how prayer works. But I know this much. It is not about the coins. It is not a transactional thing between me and God. It's not some kind of mechanical process that I can manipulate. It is not about giving information to God that God doesn't already know. Like, you know, I'm praying and God would say, Oh, oh wait, you lost a son? I didn't, I didn't know. Thank you for letting me know that. I'm sorry. It's not like that. So in the midst of our not knowing, the best we can do, I think, is to repeat what that disciple says to Jesus. Lord, teach us how to pray. Because we're always rookies, we're always students, we're always learning to pray better. And if you listen to Jesus' response, it's not an explanation of how prayer works. It's not that. He doesn't give us magic words or some secret formula that if we just do this, then we're going to get everything we want. In other words, Jesus is not giving us uh, you know, enough quarters for the vending machine. Instead, Jesus is trying to teach us something about who God is. And he says, 
to the disciple, when you pray, say the following words, Abba, your name is holy. May your realm come. Give us each day what we need, our daily bread. Forgive us our limitations because we ourselves are busy forgiving everybody who is indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of testing. God is our divine parent, and we are God's holy daughters and sons, imperfect though we may be. That means that before you and I even open our mouths, before we even offer our coins or make our selection in the vending machine, we are in relationship with God. And so that is how Jesus begins his teaching. Prayer is about relationship. We're not telling God something God does not already know. We are reminding ourselves what is, what always has been, what will always be. If prayer, the way Jesus tries to teach it, if prayer really is all about relationship and presence, then there is only one possible answer to every single prayer. God. God is the answer to every single prayer. And I don't mean it in the sense that, you know, God answers our prayer, but God is God's self, the answer, God's presence, life, love, compassion, generosity, grace, forgiveness, wisdom, insight, justice, mercy, all of that because God is trying to give God's very self as the answer to every single prayer uttered by every single person. That is what Jesus is telling us. And that reveals our biggest problem, our biggest stumbling block when it comes to prayer, because sometimes we just want to plunk in the correct change, make our selection, push the button, grab the joystick. We don't want God. We don't want God. We want something from God. We want magic Jesus to swoop out of the sky and do some stunts for us. change our circumstances. And sometimes, to be sure, God can and does change those circumstances, but more often than not, God changes us. God changes us. God's self-giving sustains, nourishes, strengthens, fortifies, empowers, enables us to face life as it is, whatever the circumstances. And so that's what we do. That's what we do as believers. Sometimes, sometimes we do this with joy and a smile and, and gratitude and a heart full of thanks giving, and other times we do it with tears and sadness and deep pain, but we always do it with God. On my very best Father Michael days, I know this, but I get it. I accept 
accepted in my heart and in my mind. And it's enough. But on the other 99% of my days, it really is just a humble request. Lord, teach me to pray. So on this day, July 25th, I have been a Benedictine since 1982, and I made my final profession only a few numbers, uh, you know, two years ago. And so uh, when I had to go to the cathedral and prostrate myself uh, before the bishop, and then compose my own vows, uh, which I did. He told me to re reimagine Benedict's uh, traditional vows in relation to my own personality so that they would mean something to me. And so, like every Benedictine, these vows will be with me when I leave this earth. And so, here they are. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Michael Paul Holland, desiring the blessing of good days in the hope of achieving a good life according to God's design, willingly and with confidence in the power of grace, take upon myself this day, the 25th day of July, in the year of our Lord, 2009, the three monastic vows of stabilitas, conversio morum, and obediencia. I promise to say a persistent yes to the promptings of spirit, regardless of the challenges. I will honor the commitments I make, and I will stand ready to accomplish what is asked of me in the here and now. I will seek God both in the silence and in the daily activities of my life. I promise to be attentive and to look daily for ways to continue my conversion of heart. I will remember the abundance that God places in my life at every moment, even in times of trial. I will release and surrender unworthy things that my efforts on behalf of God's realm might be credible and effective. I promise to listen to all that is asked of me with alertness and affection. I will strive to hear the hidden questions that lie behind the words of those with whom I interact, and to respond truly and from the heart that in all things, all things, my words and choices, faith and doubt, joy and pain, life and death, God may be glorified. With gratitude, pledge filial allegiance to the Virgin Mary, my mother, who has sheltered me in the darkest of times. Under the protection of her mantle, I rest secure. Ut in omnibus gloria cetetur Deus. Amen. And now, may the God of peace peace that is beyond our understanding be with you and all those you love.